Dear Father in heaven, the sun is here, your presence is here, we are in a warm place, and so we thank you that we can be together this morning to worship you in all the circumstances, in all the highs and in all the lows of our lives. We are governed by small, simple things, whether we're hungry or whether we're not, whether we're tired or not, whether... The, what the weather is. There's so many little factors that cause our moods to rise and fall. But we know that you are not this, that way. You are always the same. And that even the scripture says yesterday and today and forever, that a, a thousand years or a day, that these things which fluctuate for us do not fluctuate for you. And so we're aware this morning that just the circumstances of us, of just the weather being a little nasty or uh, even hazardous, is nothing to you. You still deserve our praise and our gratitude and our glory. And the glory, the glory that we can give to you and ascribe to you. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. This is what we want to do this morning. And we pray that it would be honoring to you. As in spirit and in truth, we worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Um, Feel free to stand with me if you're able and join me in singing. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise in things yet to come.
And Jesus has said in this world, you will have troubles, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Um, this next song is probably a new song for you, so feel free to join as you learn it, or if you already know it, feel free to join me in singing.
If you can just remain standing for a moment. Do you have words for the Apostles' Creed? Can we put that up and uh, just make this statement together that folks have been using to express their faith for centuries and centuries of time? Can you read it with me? And then I'd like to lead us in prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended to the right heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in your hearts and your minds for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we say, we speak, we express what it is that we believe. And yet, we know that you, as much as that perhaps makes you happy, what you really, really value and take seriously is what we do because of what we believe, that you don't see our lives as an intellectual package or you don't, you don't look at salvation as just coming to a certain point of intellectual understanding, but rather it is the, the trust that we base upon what we believe. And so because of these great and grand facts, these mighty and outstanding facts that we have just said. We should be able to live our lives in, in victory and joy and peace, irregardless of whatever circumstances come. Sometimes in some days, we feel like we can do that. And we can lean on you and lay, lay back upon you and, and relax and rest in your, in your great and awesome power and control. And we know that those days must certainly uh, cause you to rejoice. Other days, other times, it seems like we struggle to reach this union between what we believe and how we act and how we feel, our emotions and our mind and the deeds of our hands and hearts, our relationships. Sometimes it seems like they just don't fit together well. And though we believe, we have to say like the, Dude said to Christ, please help my unbelief. And in all conditions, in all forms and mixtures of that, we come this morning. We stand here in your presence, in your in your house on your day. To say, Heavenly Father. We affirm this with our mouth. Even today, make it real within our heart, within our lives. We thank you. That we can hear from each other. That we can see on the li- from the lives of each other how to do this. And that in one moment and one circumstance, I can learn from my friend. And in another circumstance in time, my friend can learn from me. And that somehow together as a body, we exalt Christ and we represent Christ. And we are Christ unto this world. Renew us. Forgive us, strengthen us, and let us, comfort us, Lord, even through each other. So that the ones who weep have someone weeping with them. And the ones who rejoice do not feel they are alone in their joy because somebody else is celebrating with them because of the joy that they themselves have. Receive our honor and our glory and our praise. We receive your presence and your power. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We, could, we actually did practice this, but then this morning neither of us could remember which song we practiced. <laughs> neither, neither one of us. He came to me and said, what song did we practice? That's, I said, I really was hoping you would remember.
to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him, and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart he'll abide. Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting. see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Have faith in God when your pathway is long. Season knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the best of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Well, again, I say good morning to you if you came in late. Um, we're here because we didn't know how not to be here. So uh, thank you for your uh, intrepidness that you are willing and able to come this morning. And uh, I want to say also for Cindy and I how grateful we are, have been for your prayers in the loss of my sister and ask you to pray and reach out to Tom Clopper, in the same way that you have me, as Tom has lost one of his brothers uh, this week as well. <clears throat> we are in the book of James. We're in chapter 2. Last week we had our missions conference, as you know, and the week before that I read the verses starting with verse 14 and talked about this issue of faith and deeds. And I said, I'm going to come back to this, and we're going to hit it again from a different angle, 
And I am just so thrilled that uh, Mark Burkett has been willing also to share with me. And so he's going to talk or he's going to preach. He's going to give us uh, his thoughts and share thoughts about this issue of faith in particular and why it is that God is so insistent that we have faith. And why is it if God wants us to have faith and we have faith and we believe, as the Apostles' Creed said, I believe this and I believe that, why isn't that in itself enough to justify us if we believe exactly the right thing? Or, or, or is it? And so that's what James kind of talks about in this chapter. And he talks about, amazingly, the fact that uh, it's possible that even you can believe in God and God's not even impressed with that. And he, he mentions specifically, as an example of that, the demon spirits. And he said, they know. They know who God is. They know what God is about. But God isn't impressed with that fact. Um, in your bulletin, I, I put this little this thought in a little poem. I'm going to just read it. So how can faith be good when the hungry have no food? He talks about that, first of all, in this passage. If somebody comes along and they are hungry or they're cold or they don't have clothes, and you have a great heart of faith that God's going to supply their needs, and you say, hey, brother, I, think I've, I hope that you're just blown away by how God supplies your needs. But you don't, yourself, you don't do anything. He says God isn't impressed with that. So, how can faith be good when the hungry had no food? How can faith be real for those demons in their zeal? You say, oh, I believe. I say, you're quite naive. You have faith. Oh, whoop de doo When I ask, will faith have you? Seems to be, to me, the issue that James is really uh, dealing with there in that chapter. And first part, in, first he talks about the people who are hungry. Uh, you may have to, somebody may have to flip for me. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Here we go. But then he talks about the demons. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to them first. Let me describe the demons. And that is, no, The demons, the demons have, there you go, the demons have faith in the sense that they believe. It says they believe there's one God. So do we. We just said, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Well, the demons do too. And James says that the fact that they believe, at least intellectually, they have enough faith to believe something that they cannot deny. And God says, oh, whoop de doo You believe something that's so obvious and self-evident that you'd be ignorant and foolish to deny it. Well, why or how should that impress me? And so the demons are an example of someone that, that is so stubborn that they refuse to let what they believe impact how they live. And I see folks like this all the time. And guess what? I'm like this myself. There are times where I know. I know better. I know different. And yet, emotions, circumstances, human will and stubbornness, whatever it is, keeps me from doing what I know. Keeps me from following what I believe. So stubborn. Just like a, the devil. Just like a demonic spirit in that sense that says, I believe, I believe, I believe, and then turn right around and commit adultery with my neighbor or steal from my employer or cheat someone or whatever and act and live like the devil himself as if I don't believe or what I believe makes no difference at all. And so if I could say it like this, this is the, pers this is the, the condition of the person whose faith is so stubborn that they won't let it impact their actual living. Their creed is correct. The demons believe in one God. Good, he says. But their conduct is crazy. 
in spite of what they believe, what they, how they live doesn't follow the law. So that says to me that this is not an issue of what I believe, but how I live. So it's not my head, it's my heart. It's not the matter of having the right information, but it's a matter of letting that information become transformation in my life. In other words, this is not a matter of theory, it's reality. God says, you got the theory down. Theoretically, there's just one God. Woo, wonderful. I accept that. But what I have in theory and what I live out do not match. And so it says that to me also that, that, that the upshot of this is that belief about God, which is what it says here, James says this is what the demons have, the belief about God in itself. Because here's the question that James asked in the very first part of that, verse 14. So you have this faith. Can that save you if that's the kind of faith you have? Faith that's just theoretical? Faith that's just intellectual? Can that save you? That's the question James asked. Can faith of that type, would that be something that God would actually connect you with the work of Christ and save you? And the answer is no, not really. Belief about God is, doesn't cause you to trust in God or to submit to God. Here's the second. So, so I'm sorry, faith produces passion. In other words, saving faith is when the information becomes a conviction, not just uh, an acknowledgement but a conviction. Now, here's the second one, and I'm actually going backwards. The first one is, the, the, the second one is the demons, and now I'm going to back up to the hungry guy, the person or whatever the circumstance is, that right in my presence, there's a human need. Now, you would think that any kind of faith that's a real faith in God that looks at a human need would, be, would say, I cannot help but be involved. I cannot help, I cannot not help this person. James says, what if somebody comes to you and they're destitute? They don't have clothes, they don't have food. In other words, right in your presence, there's a human need. And if you're a person of faith, it would seem as if you would be obligated, but that's not always the case. Because many times, in spite of what we believe in our head, we're afraid, or we feel like we, we are too limited to help this person? What if they need more than I have available? And so we back off, and we say, as James says, well, I hope you have a good life, but uh, I can't help you, or I won't help you. I'm not available. We express goodwill, but we do nothing. And so, if I could say it like this, there's a difference between being what, what, having a motive, having a, a desire, and actually being motivated. And he says, look, a person who, who has faith that only sees what should be, so their motive is good in a, a real an altruistic motive, but there's something missing between their motive and their motivation. And their motivation is so weak that they say, well, I, I, I can only say to you, my friend, I hope someone will help you. James says, can faith like that save you? Is, is saving faith, is this, is this the kind of faith that's saving faith? <clears throat> I'm amazed at how at times that human need in the most extreme cannot motivate people. They, it will put tears in our eyes. But it does not in itself have enough in it to motivate us if our faith is not saving faith. In other words, if I'll say it like this, there are times that the only possible reason that I will help or be involved is because I'm a Christian. It's not because I like you. It's not because I feel sorry for you. You would think that would do it. Oh, I feel so sorry for this person. And I'm going to therefore just put my goods at their, my resources at their disposal, but can't always do that. I don't have the motivation unless my faith has touched something that releases the power of God in me, and then that saving faith has actually turned my 
observation into obligation. You see, liberty says, well, I can look at you, but I don't have to do anything. Love says, oh, yes, you do have to do something. That's the difference between a faith that is like the demons that's stubborn or that is so self-centered or selfish that that's all it sees and saving faith. Selfish faith is focused on what God would do me to me. Oh, I thank the Lord that he's going to take me to heaven. It's a wonderful thing. But meanwhile, here's this other, this person. And I'm not really worried about what God might do through me. I'm more interested in what God might do to me. So, real faith produces not only passion, but compassion as well. Mark, I'm going to just come back later. But you tell, talk to us. Thank you. Have a green light. Okay. Good morning. So winter is not over yet. Um, everybody gets up in this, this morning and it's really cold and there's some of the snow came back or blew back. I don't know where it came from. Um, but the thing is, is that despite the fact that winter keeps reminding us that it's not gone yet, we still hold on to the hope that spring's coming. And we know that it's coming and warmer days are ahead. And I think that teaches us a lot, and I'm not going to get into that because that's not why I'm up here. But I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Were you able to get? Okay. Also, thank you to my sweet sister, Holly. I drugged my feet all last week. Um, it's nobody's fault but my own. Of try It's been a kind of a hectic week trying to get um, some things together. And uh, I sent her a text saying, hey, is anybody in the office today? It was Friday. And she's, she said, well, I'm, I might be heading in. What do you need? And I said, well, never mind. I said, I'll work it out on my own. But she came in and loaded these verses up for me, so I'm really appreciative of that. So we read that creed this morning. Everybody kind of affirmed the same statements. If I go through there and poll each individual person and say, do you really believe what you read this morning? I would think most of us would say, yeah, we do. However, it's interesting, too, that despite the fact that we all affirm those same statements that were up on the board, we will find people with very, very different outlooks on life, very, very different faiths, wouldn't we? The way that people would react to everyday situations, the way that they... And so the question comes out is, uh, why do people affirm that and yet still seem to have different faiths? Why is that? Why do people seem to not have all the same faith? You would think that we would. Um, and so to do that, I'm just going to talk a little bit this morning about kind of what faith is, maybe get us a good definition, because like Dave, David um, suggested, that sometimes we think that we have uh, the idea, you know, kind of planted in our mind for fairly well, and yet we don't kind of respond to it in the way that we should. And so maybe it's because, you know, we all have these different ideas about what faith actually is, and particularly what is saving faith. And to look at that, we're gonna have, I'm going to have to overlap with some stuff that David had either already said this morning or two weeks ago when we were talking about faith versus works. But there's two different camps that we run into mostly, basic camps of thought when it comes to what faith is and how it relates to our salvation. And the first camp would say, okay, here's the equation for salvation. God's grace plus maybe a little bit of our belief plus nothing else equals salvation. And they say, you cannot add anything else to it. There is nothing else that you can get to that. It's just that. That's it. Well, then you would, and, and they would hang their hat probably on this verse that I have up here that's in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not, not of works, lest any man, sorry, I... I got to tell you, I'm not looking at what I have here, and it doesn't say what it says on the board. I'm, I learned most of my memory verses in the basement of this church um, because of release time, and back in those days, it was King James Version, so I have a tendency to drift into King James and back into whatever. We're, so in case you're wondering why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm using two different translations, that's why. Um, but they hang their hat on this verse that says, it's just faith alone. There's nothing that you can do. There's no works. There's no nothing else. Um, another idea is in Romans 3, where he's, um, Paul is talking a little bit about, he talks a little bit about Abraham, but he's talking about righteousness. 
And he says, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So right there, Paul tells you that's just that. That's right, you know. But then we get another idea from James and what we're talking about today that says in two different verses there, in 17 he says, so faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And then he says in 24, you see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So who's right? <laughs> so you have two different people saying you can't have, so you have the one that says it's just faith alone, but then you have this other camp that comes in like James is saying and says, now wait a minute, we don't have a cheap grace here. We cannot just say, oh, well, we believe and we have the faith and that's all that it takes. Um, we, we can't have individuals who trust in Jesus to be their Savior, but not to be their Lord. And so you get this kind of back and forth going on and kind of a dichotomy that says, well, you know, these aren't, you know, you can't just, just say that it's just grace. There's got to be this other component. So, okay, what does Jesus have to say about it? Well, in John 3, uh, he is talking to Nicodemus, remember, and that's where we get the famous verse of John 3, 16. And he tells us how we get to, you know, eternal life. And, and it says, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But at the end of this chapter, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, which is kind of what he says before. But whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So Jesus is saying also, apparently, that there is other components that are involved in our faith. And it's not just, like David said, an intellectual belief, but there's this other component that has to happen as well, whereby we are actually living the life that God would have us to live. And so I would submit that the problem becomes is not so much who's right in these types of situations back and forth, and the, that the, 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 there is no dichotomy. There is, in fact, a misunderstanding of what saving faith actually is. Because all too often we'll say, we think of faith in the saving faith in the terms of what are the minimum requirements that I have to, rem, to affirm in order to get into heaven when I die. That's what we kind of boil our faith down to, saving faith, is that what's the minimum requirements that I'm supposed to check the box off so that I can get into heaven when I die. And the reality of it is, is this is not the way that Jesus talked about faith at all. If you think about it, men in this room who are married, if building up to your marriage, you say to your future spouse, Honey, what is the minimum amount of fidelity that I have to exercise in order for us to not get divorced? Where is the line? Where, what, what, what's the minimum amount that I have to do? I don't think that she would be too happy with that question. I don't think you would be married at this point. Or you could look at it this way, and apparently maybe some of this stuff is actually going on. Somebody goes in for a job interview, and they kind of learn and hear about the job from their prospective employer, and they look at that person, and they say, okay, you know how they always go, hey, okay, do you have any questions for us? And your question is, what's the minimum amount of work that I have to do in order not to get fired? <laughs> I don't think you would have that job as you walked out of that interview, would you? So there's more to it than just what's the minimum uh, requirements that I have to affirm in order to get into heaven when I die. I think that Jesus said, through me, through my life, my death, and resurrection, the presence, power, and favor, and love of God is available to each and every one of you in this life, in this life. If you want that, follow me. And so the whole idea of saving faith is that Jesus is asking you to trust him in everything, not just with your eternal life. I think sometimes the problem that we run into in churches and stuff is we want to get people to the point where we've gotten them to trust Jesus for their eternal life, but we haven't kind of drilled home the idea that we also need to trust him for our everyday lives. And so that's where the saving faith comes in, is that by having this kind of faith, you are actually inviting Jesus into every aspect of your life and that you trust in him for everything, not just for your eternal 
salvation or your eternal uh, existence. And so the saving faith in a nutshell, if I had to define it on a piece of paper, and we're trying to get away from that because we want to get away from the intellectual and get more into um, how, it, how it translates into our lives, but saving faith would be a total dependence and complete trust in God, meaning that it doesn't matter what you're doing or what aspect of your life, nothing is shut off from him because you trust that he has the best intentions for you, not only in the life to come, but the life that you have right now. And so, because the kind of faith that matters to God is the faith that changes a life, saving faith, to the point where it makes a difference in what we do. And that's kind of like what um, David was talking about a little bit. So to kind of get at that, I'd like to talk about, there's three different kinds of beliefs or faith or convictions, however you want to do it. There's a, a writer by the name of Michael Novak, and he come up with these three different kinds of faith, and we'll see if we can kind of identify these in our lives. The first one is a public conviction. This is stuff that we just kind of tell other people. This is what we believe and that kind of stuff, kind of like what we read this morning, uh, the Apostles' Creed, but we go out and tell other people this is what, you know, this is where we stand on a certain issue or, or whatever. So it's public, but it may not necessarily kind of align with your life just simply because eh, I'm just putting that out there for public spin, for public consumption. Um, we're coming up on a mid-year term election cycle, and uh, it's going to be a big one because it's supposed to, you know, as we know, it's a midterm of the presidency, and it's supposed to give a, the, both parties some sort of signal as to um, what kind of chance that they have of taking the White House in 2024. And so you're going to hear between now and November all of these kinds of public convictions that these politicians have. I know that that's a surprise to you, but they are telling you something that you want to hear because you kind of, it, you win favor, they, they win favor with you by telling you what you want to hear. A uh, biblical example of that would be when King Herod, uh, the wise men come to King Herod and they tell him, you know, they ask him the whole story and he, has, he tells the wise men, go make your search for the child and when you find him, come back and tell me. And he says, for what reason? So that I can too can go and, and worship him as well. Now we all know that that was not Herod's intention. It was just, again, a kind of some sort of political spin and stuff like that that he's put on him. So that's public conviction. Second one is a private conviction, and this is where it kind of gets tricky for us as individuals because these are the things, not only that we say we believe, but we actually think that we believe them. We've convinced ourselves that we believe them, but when circumstances shift or whenever those beliefs are challenged, that sometimes we become a little bit fickle and we kind of, kind of drift away from them. Um, I'm trying to think of a good day-to-day -day example of that, but it's kind of more or less along the lines of... Uh, you know, we, we think that we have it all figured out, and then when those things get, ch you know, challenged, we th we, uh, we'll say, for example, you know, that my money is God's money or whatever, but then whenever things start to get a little bit tough financially for us, when our job is at stake maybe, and there's, a, there's rumors of layoffs and that kind of stuff, you know, that kind of plays a little bit with that belief, doesn't it? We think that we believe this thing, and we would tell other people that we believe that, but once that belief is actually challenged, then we kind of not sure that we believe it so much, or we don't act as though we do. Biblical example of this is Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them that they're all going to fall away from him um, when it comes time that he gets arrested. And Peter speaks up, of course, and Peter's the, you know, the big mouth a little bit, and he says, Lord... Even if everybody else falls away, I will not fall away. I will never disown you. And that's what he tells Jesus. Now, was that his belief at the time? Was he sincere? I think so, based on, on that moment in time. But when push came to shove and people were like, to the one that was with the Nazarene, you know, et cetera, et cetera, Peter folded like a lawn chair, didn't he? He did not realized that his belief that he, thought, that he even told himself that he believed was strong enough to get through that. And so when he got challenged, then he kind of folded a little bit. That's, that's kind of a private conviction. And so those are, those are the tricky ones because, like I said, we've convinced ourselves that that's what we believe and that's where we're at. And so when we read things like the Creed, we would say, yes, yes, I believe all of those things. Um, but then sometimes when they get challenged, then we're not so sure. 
And so it would be interesting for us, I think, if an all-knowing observer watched us on our everyday lives and paid attention to everything that we did, and then in the morning when you came into church, you were handed a slip of paper that was specific for you, and that when it came time to read the creed, you had to read the creed that was specific for you based on their observations of your behavior and your actions. And then instead of reading what's up on the, on the screen, you would have to read actually what guided your behavior and what you actually believed. Do you think that would be a little bit scary? I know it would be for me. I know that, you know, sometimes, you know, certain things would be like, hey, a lie is a pretty bad thing, but it, it works for me sometimes when I need to get out of a situation. Uh, my finances are something that should belong to God, but whenever, again, like I said, whenever that gets challenged by some external circumstance, I'm not so sure that I, I couldn't gra grip a little bit tighter and a little bit hold on to some of those finances, keep some things back, you know, just for a rainy day. And so it's often difficult to know what it is that we actually believe. The third one, and this is the one that I really wanted to highlight, is our core convictions. These are convictions that aren't just what we say, isn't just what we think, but are things that we actually guide our actual everyday behavior. Because the reality of it is, is that our core beliefs are the ones that guide our actions, and we never violate the things that we actually truly believe in our core. Let me say that one more time. We never violate what you actually believe in your core, because they will always guide your behaviors. They will always guide everything that you do. For example, I believe in gravity. Nobody has to tell me anything about gravity. My behavior is always congruent with my belief in gravity. I don't have to work very hard to not like step off of this thing and you know fall down or, or jump off of a cliff and something and think, okay, well, I'll, I'll still stay where I'm at. No, I, that's my belief and I always be work towards that. And so that's just kind of an everyday thing. A biblical example of that is Jesus himself. He's the one that exhibited this kind of reaction that when people followed him and looked at him and saw his everyday life and how he conducted himself, they realized that there was complete congruence between what he said, what he thought, and what he actually did. And so kind of where the rubber meets the road, everybody looked at Jesus and said, I want his life. I like the way that he lives his life. I like his actions and all those types of good things. And so a lot of his followers went from having faith in Jesus to actually having the faith of Jesus, meaning that they realized that what they really truly believe is affected, will affect what, not only what they say about their beliefs and what they think about their beliefs, but what they actually do in regards to those beliefs. And so we have those those things that, um, that we defined as being saving faith, and so it just somewhat becomes a little bit difficult then to know, well, what do we do about this? What do we, what do we need to do so that we have the kind of faith that affects our actions in the way that God would have us? Because I believe that that's also a little bit about what James is talking about when he says, you have faith and I have deeds. It goes also a little bit more beyond about doing nice things for other people who are also in need and that kind of stuff. I think it goes into, you have faith and I have works that show what my faith is in the sense of everything that I do, forgiving somebody is better than holding a grudge, sharing the wealth that I have with other people so that they can have an easier life. All of these things are things that show that we have that kind of faith and it actually has guidance over our lives. So one of the other things that I'd like to talk about, though, is in addition to what faith is, is what faith is not. And so oftentimes, I've done this before where I've taught people, and we, we actually played the old 70s uh, game show match game. You remember that with Gene Rayburn and the microphone that was probably about this long? Um, and we, you play the match game with them a little bit, and you start saying you know, things like, okay, well, the opposite of this is this. So what is the opposite of faith? And overwhelmingly, a lot of people will say, well, the opposite of faith is doubt. And I'm going to tell you the something that kind of brought this up, that the reason I'm up here is because David and I were talking about this several months ago. I don't necessarily believe that the opposite of faith is doubt. And the reason I say that is because that sometimes 
not doubt in the sense that we, you know, we're not, we're like agnostic about our faith or we, or any of that kind of stuff. It's more doubt in the sense of, do I really believe that or do I not believe that? Do I, is, is Jesus right about that? If I'm, if I let go of this one thing in my life, am I going to still be okay? You know, that type of doubt. And the reason why I say it's not the opposite of your faith is that because I can, I think it can actually help define your faith. That if you're careful enough not to let it over the doubt overcome, that you can allow that doubt to kind of coincide and walk alongside of your faith to actually give it some substance, to give it boundaries to, to know exactly what it is. Because the idea of even to doubt something, you have to believe that there are criteria by which something can be judged. And so people who even say, well, I don't believe this, and I don't believe that, I don't have need for faith. They, everybody has need for faith because they have to believe something in order to doubt it in the first place. And the, let me, I said that wrong, sorry. You have to have the ability to believe in a certain set of criteria by which you're going to judge a certain idea. And so in order to do that, you have to at least believe in something in order to, to line alongside that. And so I think that doubt is to believe as like darkness is to light. That if you allow doubt to make you uh, have a conversation about what is my faith really all about and what does it have to do, then your doubt can actually strengthen you in such a way. The, the verse that I kind of hang my hat on is this. Actually, I, didn't, I did not put that one in. Is 2 Corinthians 5, 7 talks about faith. And it says, we walk by faith, not by... So maybe the opposite of our faith is not doubt, but actually sight. Like if everything is kind of laid out for you and you don't have to have any kind of faith to believe in it because you can see it right there, then that kind of, in a way, destroys your faith, doesn't it? For example... Who believes that I have a dollar bill in my hand? Nobody believes I have a dollar bill in my hand. Or you just don't want to be embarrassed. Or you don't, or you don't care that I have a dollar bill. Nobody believes it? Okay, David believes it. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to destroy David's faith. Because I'm going to show him whether I do, whether I do or I don't. Once I open my hand, I've destroyed his faith, right? because he sees the actual result. So the opposite of faith is not doubt, it's sight. And it just so happens that I do have. Yeah. <laughs> and so since your faith should be rewarded. Well, guess what? If, if you didn't have one, I'm prepared. <laughs> I was so, going to say, sure he does, right? So here. So your faith should be rewarded. Now. Who believes I have a $100 bill in my hand? <laughs> Nobody wants to take me up on that. I didn't, by the way. Um, doubt is a good servant, but it can be a very, very bad master. And so it's not to say that doubt isn't a negative as cannot be a negative aspect on our lives. It actually can be if we allow it but it also can help us define what our faith is. And so I don't always necessarily think that, that doubt is the opposite of faith. I think sight is. And so if you constantly are relying on some, like some of these people, of, I need evidence. I need to be able to see that before I can say yes or no. That does not require any faith. So then that leads us into the question, well, why does God require faith of us? Why do we have to believe something in order to come to him? Why can't he just show up and say, here I am, I'm God, and this is everything that you need to know. Happens to be that he did, by the way, but not, not in our lifetime. But the thing is, is that we want, you know, all doubt, we, we, we want everything laid out there for us, and that does not require faith. So why does God require that we have some faith to come to him? And a couple of things that I came up with is, first of all, that... Um, back in that, those verses of um, 8 and 9 where he says, not of works lest any man should boast, it's the whole idea that faith is required because it kind of shows that God did all the work in the sense of your salvation. Um, it's not anything that, and it, he says, not of works lest any man should boast. 
It's basically saying uh, it didn't have anything to do with you. You did not do anything. The faith in, in my grace for you is what did all this work. And you can't boast about it because the thing is, is if we didn't need faith, then we would have to come up with some other mechanism, right, by which we come to him. And so if somebody does those things a little bit better than someone else, then someone could say, well, I'm, I'm better than you. I, I deserve salvation more than you because look how much of a better job I did at doing this one thing versus what you've done. And God's saying, no, nah, I did the work, not you guys. And what we do isn't good enough anyway. And so that's the first reason I think that faith is necessary. Secondly is the focus of our faith, meaning that to have faith means we actually have to focus on God himself and, and, and look to him. And so D David's going to talk about Abraham here, I think, in his second portion of, uh, of the sermon. And I would say that Abraham is held up as a, as a you know, pillar of faith, but Abraham sometimes faltered in the way that he conducted himself, didn't he? He told people lies so that they wouldn't kill him and take his wife. He, um, him and uh, sorry, Sarah uh, hatched this plan to have a child because they couldn't wait long enough on God. And so while Abraham is upheld as this character of faith, he faltered sometimes. But the reality of it is, is that Abraham's faith is and was determined by the character of the God that he trusted in, not him himself. And so the reason why God asks us to have faith to come to him is because it points everybody to him, that they can see that they're, you know, they're the, he's the object of their faith, and so their actions themselves isn't what gets things done, it's the faith in him. Thirdly, I would say that faith is an integral part of any relationship. That if you think about the relationships that you have with your spouse, with your family and your loved ones and your friends and that kind of stuff, think about the amount of faith that it takes just to have a relationship with them. That you have to build trust in them somehow and you have to leave yourself vulnerable to them. And so I think it's God's way of saying that faith, he knows that faith is integral to relationships. And so if you're going to have a relationship with God, then that means that you have to um, have faith as well. And so faith isn't belief in a doctrine, it's trust in a person. And so if I leave you with nothing else, I want you to know that faith doesn't have anything to do necessarily with any of our actions, with the things that we say or think we believe. It's our trust in a person for our everyday lives. And I want to say that the I like this quote, and I'd like for us to read it together from Elton Trueblood. Let's read this. The deepest conviction of the Christian is that Christ was not wrong. So your faith is actually stating to everybody that through everything in my life, no matter what the circumstances are, that I trust that what he had to say about this circumstance is true, and that I'm going to live my life as a result of that belief. And so that will guide our behavior. And so along those lines, I want to tell you a quick kind of story is that there's a writer, but he's more than a writer. He was a theologian. He, was, uh, he taught the divinity school at Yale for the longest time. His name was Henry Nowen. And I think he passed away probably more than 10 years ago. But he used to write all these books, and he got really sick towards the end of his life. And so he wrote a lot of stuff about suffering and that kind of thing. But one of the interesting things about him is that he took a sabbatical and he decided that he wanted to follow around this circus of all things that a theologian or a teacher of divinity could do is to follow around this circus. And he got fascinated by this group in the circus called the Flying Rodleys. They were the trapeze artists. And so he followed them around and he wanted to get to know more about them and that kind of stuff and what it took to be a trapeze artist. And so he went and talked to, talked to them and they explained explained to him a bunch of different things, but the main thing was is that apparently there's two different kinds of trapeze artists. There's flyers and they're catchers. And the ones, and you can kind of get the idea of which is which, so that when you see them kind of swing together and stuff, there's one person who's responsible for being a flyer where they let go of their trapeze, they do their tumble salts or whatever, and they fly through the air and then the catcher catches them and then that's it. And so they're explaining all this stuff and they said, you know, flyers, they said, are little guys. You know, they like 150 pounds or less because 
Um, when you're a catcher, you don't want a guy like me flying towards you. <laughs> so they're little guys, right? And then they said that the guy that was the catcher um, had to wear like these, this magnesium powder on his hands inside of socks because his hands were always sweaty. And so if you're a flyer, you don't want a catcher that has sweaty hands. So I couldn't be a catcher either. Um, <laughs> so, but he's talking about this and he's talking about how it works. And, and so finally they say to him the one time, they said, everybody in the crowd, uh, the flyer, the guy that was the flyer said to him, everybody thinks in the crowd that I'm the star of the show. But the star of the show is actually Joe, my catcher. Because he has to be there for me when I come to him the long jump. And they said, how, how, does the, how does all this work? And he said, the secret is, the secret is, the flyer does nothing and the catcher does everything. And he said, when I fly to Joe, I simply have to let go of the trapeze, outstretch my arms, and wait. And then he grabs me out of the air at the right moment and then takes me home. And he, he said, you do nothing? He said, I do nothing. He said, the flyer must fly and the catcher must catch. And so thinking back in terms of Jesus' life, and like I said, his followers always looked at him and said, you know, this is a congruent person that lived, talked, and believed all the same things. Nothing was different in any aspect of his life. And he comes along, and then finally it's time for him to let go of his trapeze. He lets go of his ministry, he lets go of his band of disciples, he lets go of everything. And then he hangs on above the earth for three hours with his arms outstretched. And he says, Father, into your hands, your hands, I commit my life, my spirit, everything. And he gets caught. I don't know what it is for each and every one of us, but there's something in that God is probably telling you that you need to let go and trust me. I don't know what it is for you. It could be different things. But I feel like God is always coming to us and say, you know, you don't have to hang on like that. You can let go and leave this to me because I got it. And even if it comes to what our final breath on this earth or whatever it might be, we have to trust with outstretched arms that there's going to be a catcher there that's going to grab us and take us home. must be it. You know, Mark, I was going to talk just a very briefly about uh, Abraham and Rahab. I don't think I need to. I feel like the, the points you made are so powerful there as our closing. Um, I'll just give you the two words if you want to put them on your sermon notes. What James says is that because of the faith Abraham was compliant. He was obedient when God said, I want your son. And because of the faith that she had, Rahab was committed to doing something that was quite dangerous, actually, for her to do. So if you want to put those two words, you can think about them. Yeah, there you go. I'll honor God. Because the faith that saves changes your priorities. It doesn't just change your intellect, but changes your priorities. So that you do deeds, but you also have different priorities. Um, thank you for uh, sharing that. You know, I, when you were talking about the core commitment, I almost felt like James is saying, in a way, you don't even have to tell me what you believe. I see it. I can see your life, and I know what you believe. Can we sing together a verse from this song that says, I know whom I have believed. And as Paul said, I am I'm convinced there's nothing that could ever alter my mind from the conviction that he will catch me, that he will keep what I've committed unto him until the end. And that's a, that's a tremendous illustration. As I'm flying through the air, I'm persuaded, and he's able to keep what I've committed to him. He's able to catch me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for catching us. Let us fly. Just let us, Lord, let go of what we would, would hinder us and hold us back. And just put this, this kind of trust in, in you that, that you reach out to and say, Oh, yes, I will catch. I will save you. We, we just want to thank you for bringing us safely here.
as we go to our Sunday school classes, uh, as we go home later on, we pray you will take us safely to our home and our family and to our culture and our society where others can see from our core convictions believe and they can be inspired and changed and and drawn to you their own selves through Christ our Lord we pray amen thank you for being brave enough to come out here today